Hi everyone and uh, welcome to today's session. So today is a very interesting one because it's touching on a topic that I'm very interested in, which is how we store, how we encode memories, how we retrieve memories, and most importantly, how we use this memory to learn. As you know, like humans, we don't only learn from like neural network weights updating that kind. We actually learn from experiences we have in our lives. Like for example, if you walk down one path, you see a snake you'll probably not walk down that path again next time because you have that memory and you will go somewhere that is safer. So memory helps us in a lot of things in life. It helps you remember who you are, what place you stay in. It helps you remember a lot of things. And with all this memory that you have, you can then change the way you behave, change the way you act. And it also gives you like the personality and so on. So memory is really very useful. And I think with the rise of like this transformer architectures, memory is becoming more and more important because we are starting to look at how we remember things, not just from internal memory, but also how we retrieve external memory, how we interface a lot of things together. And memory being past experience can help to guide future actions in a more consistent and more fruitful way. So let's take a look at how we can use memory to help improve current AI systems. So. This is just some background about why I feel about memory and how memory is structured. So this is In Search of Memory. I'm just curious how many of you all have read this book. It's by Eric Kandel, talking about the sea slug apicia and like how the axon like kind of, or rather the, the synapse between the neurons, how it actually increased the strength, okay? If like there's a kind of, uh, like similar signals together, you will actually potentiate the, the synapse, okay? If let's say it's a, like, I, I, I believe this is something to do with the timing also. So your timing of the, uh, the pulse of the neuron, okay, the signal must be like after the, the neuron fires. Yeah, so, so there's some form of timing, I can't remember the exact terms, but this will help to give rise to long-term potentiation, depression, and the synaptic strength will be altered. So he did a lot of experiments on the C-slug alpicia. And I think it's a very interesting thing to see like how this neuron strengths can actually alter based on external stimuli. Okay, but this is ultimately still at the neuron level, at a very, very narrow focus level. And I believe memory is not just at the synapse level. Memory should be more network level. And because there's a lot of signals that can come in, just understanding how the synapse change, the synaptic strength changes, is not really indicative of how we store memory. So I've come up with this idea. Actually, it's not really my idea, but I think neuroscience has slowly shifted into trying to understand memory as a network. Okay, the main reason is because memory is not just isolated to one region. Like, you know, people think that the hippocampus stores everything, like you consolidate memory, hippocampus, and then after you consolidate, go to the cortex. Yeah, that's the general theory. But actually, if you remove away like certain parts of the brain, like for example, hippocampus, you can still remember stuff. Like it's not just isolated to that one region. Rather, memory can be stored in a distributed sense. And I believe this distribution has something to do with the inputs as well. So like you can go to like some region near the ears for audio, some region near the eyes for your visual memory. Spatial memory is like mm -hmm. the place cells, grid cells, probably in the neocortex or, mm -hmm. or some other region that's involved in uh, navigation, right? Then you also have sensation, like for example, your pain, your touch, or this is also a different region of the brain. And the brain is really quite, quite interesting because it's able to piece together all this different sensory information and put them into one coherent whole. Like you, you wouldn't believe it, but you know, um, we actually can see things faster, eh, sorry, see things slower than we hear things. Okay, this is uh, one example. You know, runners, whenever they run, it, we don't really use a flash to tell them, okay, green light means you run. Normally when people run, you know what um, they use to start the race? A anyone? Like for competitive running, what is the signal to start the race? Okay, so actually it's, it's a gun. It's like you, you just fire one gun, and this boom sound, and then that, that will be the signal of the start of the race. Okay, and that's because we actually process the auditory information faster than we do our vision system. So the vision system is more hierarchical in nature. 
the audio system is less hierarchical in nature. It, it gets processed faster. But the amazing thing is when you picture things together, you picture your audio and your, um, and your visual systems as though it's the same time. Like when you hear someone speak, you wouldn't really hear his voice, his or her voice first before you see his or her mouth move. It actually comes in synchrony, which means that actually what we perceive about, about the world around us might actually be a few like, milliseconds lag from the actual stimuli. So there's a way to coherently pick, piece all this together. And I believe it's also stored in this coherent way. Like whatever things you hear, whatever things you see, that memory itself is stored in distributed places but it can be all triggered together at the same time to actually find out, like, okay, if you see a particular place, oh, maybe I pass by a school, I remember my, my school anthem, that kind of thing. So all these memories get triggered similarly. And this is something that's quite interesting. This tells me that memory is not just at the synaptic mem uh, at level, that's too narrow a view. We should instead focus on more general memory structures that involve networks, especially networks between the various sensory organs. Okay, so this is quite cool. And I think until now, people still haven't really found out how this distributed memory is done. Yeah, I mean, I've done like some thoughts about uh, how this can be done, like the incomplete hash retrieval in one of my earlier videos. But today's focus is not on this. Today, today's focus will be like, what is the kind of way we encode this memory and how we can retrieve this memory? So let's um, move on. Before I, before I just go to the next slide, um, just pause here for a while and anyone has any questions so far on what has been covered. Okay, all good. All right, so this is something that I want to highlight a bit, okay, because this is something that I've been thinking about for months, okay, not just weeks, it's months, all right? I've been thinking about how memory is encoded in the brain and I've come to this view that memory might be encoded with two different points, all right? The first point is the reference point Okay, and the second way is uh, the second thing that is encoded is the movement, all right? So if you think about it, all right, this actually can all be represented by vectors. Like your initial reference point can be like, like maybe if if it's a two D vector, it can be like that, and then the movement can also be represented by a vector. So I mean, if you look at it in the Cartesian coordinate, it's like as though you are shifting the initial point by a certain movement mm -hmm. to another point. And you know why why do I say memory should be stored in this kind of manner? It's because a lot of things in our lives are split into this kind of reference point plus movement. So let's take a look at some of the concepts. All right. So for example, for science, all right, mm -hmm. you all know that science consists of like objects moving, like physics, you know, you push a ball and the ball moves. It fits very naturally with like this memory point of like an object and then a movement. Because this is how science works, all right? You can also treat like chemical equations, like you have like H2 plus O2 plus some reactant and then you get H2O. I'm not too sure whether that's the right equation, but, but I mean, you can also treat it as starting states plus an action. And the action is like the, the movement. So like, for example, if you have H2 plus O2, I remember already. yeah i mean how do you make h2o there must be some way i mean it, it's either you do this or you use another method yeah but if let's say this is the way to make h2o you know you can have the start state all right and then you have an action which is that kind of reaction that happens and then you have the end state here all right so this kind of way of like transiting from one state to another we can actually store this as memory all right i mean this is actually quite similar to reinforcement learning you have a state here you have an action and then you have a state prime, which is the, the next state. So this framework of memory fits in very nicely to state action state of reinforcement learning as well. The way we vectorize this memory, have a start state. Okay, that is like the key. The start state is like the key. You perform the action, which is like the kind of uh, um, some process, and then you get another state. All right, so this part here is what I think memory stores, like this, this part here. Let me just draw this. Yeah, the initial position plus the motion is what we re remember, all right? I mean, think about it in terms of other forms of memory, like for example, motion, like if I move my hand, okay, my hand starts here, then I take an action and I move closer to, to the screen maybe. So this, this kind of movement also has a start point and an action, 
geography, all right, geography is quite standard. I mean, you have, you have stuff like, you know, if let's say this is like the, uh, okay, let's, let's just put, okay, since we are in Singapore, let's uh, just put like, this is Singapore. And at the top here, maybe we have the rest of Asia, like Malaysia. Down here, we have Indonesia, you know. So all these things here, and maybe all the way up here, we have US, you know. So in geography, we have a starting reference point, like a country. And then we can say, I move north to the US, or I move south to Indonesia. Yeah. So, so there's a very natural sense of motion over here. History, okay. History, you might not think that you store things in a vector form with a start and a, and a movement. But if you think about it, a history is a timeline. Like in the year 1980, what happens? In the year 1990, what happens? In the year 2000, what happens? So you flow naturally through the timeline. Math, a lot of things, okay, have to do with number lines, right? And even the more abstract kind of math, you're like moving through a manifold. All this also has a form of mo motion. So all these kind of things came to me that the way that we store memory maybe in our brains, has also to do with these two sections of memory, the reference point and the motion, right? Uh, I forgot to cover this just now, but this one is for the science one. Let's say you have a start point, like a pendulum, and then the motion is like to swing here, and then you can get the new position here. Yeah. So this is uh, what I think, um, how memory is thought, okay? And let's just take a look at like how this helps with the learning process, all right? So again, this is my own view, all right? How memory is used for generalization is like this. The initial reference point that we have over here can maybe stop for a separate situation, like maybe for another instance, like for example, my hand on the right. So let's say the initial reference point is the hand, okay, is on the right, okay, on the right of the screen maybe. and then. I move my hand forward and then my hand goes like closer to the screen. Okay. Suppose now I have my hand instead of the right of the screen, I go to the left of the screen. So my starting position of the hand is at the left side of the screen. All right. But I want to move closer to the screen as well. So it's the same forward motion. What I can do is I can then apply this same vector of move motion from like the hand and the right. If you recognize the general orientation, you can actually if you displace it to the left like that, you can still do the same like motion to the to the end point. And this actually helps you to like, for instance, know how to do a certain action, although the circumstances might be different. Like if I were to pick up a cup right now, like this is my cup. Okay, I might be picking up the cup right now in my room. Okay, but I can do the same motion of picking up the cup at a bar or at, a, at, at school. So there's a, a lot of um, similar kinds of actions you can take to bring the cup closer to your mouth, maybe like this. But the context is different. But we can just maybe match the current states that we are in to the most similar state in memory. And then we can use the kind of motion that the memory has done. Okay, and then because you already have this reference point here that, okay, you can move this action. You can perhaps map the same vector into your current state here, and then you can get the outcome, all right? So this outcome here is, is just derived very simply from your starting position, and then you superimpose this vector of the memory that you have, the, the movement part, and then you can get your final point of where your hand would be. Like if your hand move forward, I, I will get where my hand would be. And let me just highlight this. This will be even without having experienced my hand at this point before. I just need to know from the right side, I move forward, I go forward, I go forward. From the left side, I can extrapolate that kind of motion and then I will go forward as well. So can you see that this can be quite general because you don't really need to have that particular state being experienced before. I don't need my hand being on the left. I can use the experience I have with my hand on the right and do the kind of extrapolation to move and predict where my hand will be in the future. So we can simulate various outcomes by retrieving from memory. Okay, of course, this is uh, still in theory. I'm, I'm actually working on a paper trying to like do something similar to this. Uh, still working on it. But I would say that this is a promising approach because in the real world, there's so much 
so many possibilities of states. You can't possibly have experienced everything. But if you can isolate your start point and your motion, you can perhaps apply similar kind of memories to, to guide you as to where you would be if you were to do certain actions. And um, there's a big caveat here. The big caveat is that if my hand is on the right and if my hand is on the left, I will still be able to move the same way, you know, independent of this position. So uh, there's some caveat here. And of course, if my hand on the left has a different constraint compared to my hand on the, on, on the right, then, you know, this memory kind of motion thing would fail. Okay, but we have to um, basically just assume that for most cases in the real world, you would be able to use the same kind of motion, same kind of action and do the same things. I mean, like you think about it, uh, let's say the act of moving forward. Will the act of moving forward result in the same kind of displacement if you were walking in your home versus walking in the streets outside? Okay, maybe you get some response here. Do you all think the same action at a different place would give you the same kind of outcome? A anyone? Or maybe we can just you can just raise your hand. I'm just curious to find out what you all think about it. You all think if we can extrapolate the kind of motion from our memory and apply it to the current context, will we get the same outcome most of the time? I mean, yes, you just put a thumbs up. No, you maybe put another the emotes. Okay, I haven't got any response yet. I I I I asked you that. Okay, yeah, Yong San put yes. Grace put yes or so. Okay, thanks. I think this is uh something that is interesting for me. I mean, I like to hear your feedback as well because this is uh really quite new. I haven't really seen anyone talk about this before. So um I, I think this will be a very important basis in order to build systems that use memory in order to perform generalization. Okay. So uh, yeah, if you look at the last point here, I want to just highlight current vectors of memory don't disentangle between reference and motion and movement. All right. So this is like the transformer word embeddings. We don't really have a starting point and don't really have an action. The starting point and the action is all together. So perhaps this is uh, something that could be improved on. Okay. So uh, the next thing I would like to touch on is called abstraction. So um, this is basically how we store memories. So like earlier on, you know, when we talk about like, if we look a few slides back, you have memories from the different parts of your brain, like audio, visual, spatial, now, all these different components, okay, may actually encode things differently. But how do we know how to encode it? Because like the real world um, data is really high dimensional. How do you know like this view that I have right now that I'm seeing is will be similar to the same view later on, but maybe the lights change. Okay, because if we were to take into account every like pixel intensity, there's just too many possibilities to remember. How do we encode this into a common space? Oops, into a common space. I call it the abstraction space. All right, that you can then use the same memory map into this same abstraction space. And you can then process it in the same way as you would with another kind of memory, like maybe of the same place, but different lighting. How do we know what is this abstraction space? Okay, so. I think the answer can be seen like quite well in like the transformer mod, uh, mod model. Like the initial word embeddings, you know, or token embeddings might already be the kind of extraction space that is needed in order to like map all the memories similarly. Okay, but how do you learn the initial embeddings? How do you learn the initial abstraction? Okay, I mean, people have tried different methods, contrastive learning, self-supervised learning. You can just get like the neural network to do some form of mapping to like a certain layer. And then from then on, you can learn. You can learn. So this is uh, my hypothesis. My hypothesis is like this. The first part to the abstraction space, this part of encoding memory should be fixed. Okay, it, it doesn't change. Okay, because the, the main reason is that if you change this abstraction space, right, the way you store memory, because you don't store memory at the input, all right, it's just too high dimensional to store like all the pixels you see in your eyes, okay? Uh, we may not even be seeing by pixels anyway, but you know, you, you can't store everything that you see. You have to abstract it into some like very, very simple form so that you don't overwhelm your memory. Like there's not enough space to store the high dimensional input. You need to store it in a lower dimensional 
abstraction space. And the beauty of this is that once you can find a good mapping from the high dimensional to the low, low dimensional, you just need to store this low dimensional mapping. And then you can use this to do memory prediction next time. You can use this low dimensional memory and do planning. Because when you take a high dimensional state, let me just write high dimensional here. When you take a high dimensional state, and then you map it to something low dimensional, what would happen is that you would be able to apply what you have learned elsewhere to a new situation, provided they map to a similar abstraction space. Okay, so, so this is something important. And if this part is not fixed, okay, that, that'll be the next slide. If this part here is not fixed, okay, all your previous memories that you have learned, okay, will need to change the moment the abstraction mapping changes. Because if we change this abstraction map, all right, the way that you map, like maybe giraffe to this vector, if you change this abstraction map, let's call this map G. Okay, if you change this map G, all right, this mapping function G, then all the previous like experiences you learn, like apple, pear, orange, you know, you already have a way to map them into your abstraction space in the past. If you were to change your G to G prime, okay, let's let's just call like the earlier things you store as G. And then later you store a giraffe, you store it as G prime. What will happen? Right? All these memories here become unusable when the abstraction mapping change. So this is actually quite serious because uh, what this means is that if my theory is correct, all right, uh, what I feel is that the way, like for example, humans learn, the first few years, you don't store long-term memory. Like my kid doesn't have long-term memory until like two years old, two and a half, because he kind of forgotten his friends at the earlier school there. After he transferred school, he forgotten the friends at the earlier school already at the age of 2.5 years. So they don't really have long-term memory that early, maybe about three to four years old, you have long-term memory. And um, what I feel is that the reason why you don't have long-term memory is because we haven't found this abstraction space yet. This abstraction space needs time to learn. Maybe you need to do self-supervised learning, you learn the token embeddings, you know, you know, that kind of embeddings to get to that abstraction space where you remember that abstraction space. You have not stabilized yet. So the early memories can't get stored. Okay. Only after a certain age, like maybe four years old, your long-term memory is fixed because this abstraction space is fixed already. And this abstraction space will be relatively unchanging throughout your life. Okay, because the moment this abstraction changes, you need to relearn all your memories again. So yeah, I mean, maybe you can change slightly so that it doesn't change uh, all your earlier memories. So um, the way this abstraction space thing, thing works, I think it's quite in line with like neuroscience literature about like how patients, like if they remove a certain part of their brain, like maybe those patients with like one hemisphere damage, I don't know if you've heard about it. Like there are some people that cannot see on both sides of their hemisphere. They can only see like maybe on their left hemisphere. But to them, they feel like they see everything. But what happens is because of some uh, hemorrhage or some damage to the brain, they only can see like this particular side of the vision. And so like when they're asked to describe, okay, um, make your plate full. All right, so they take their plates. They only spread the food at half of their plate. Okay, and they say the plate is full already because the other hemisphere here, they cannot see. So it's called hemisphere neglect or something like that. So when this happens, um, their memory of the world, okay, everything they have learned so far when they have this damage, everything maps only to that half of the hemisphere that they are seeing. They kind of conveniently forgot everything about the right half. And to them, it's normal. It's like as though that's always been the case of how they have been in their lives. Like they, they don't realize that they lose half their hemisphere okay, until they are told. All right? So the way that this abstraction space is done is kind of similar because like if you have the same fixed abstraction space, you lose certain functions of your, of your brain. Like for example, you lose the ability to see the, the legs maybe. This can still map to the same abstraction space because like although I don't see the legs, okay, I only see the top. The way I do the mapping is the same. So like although I only have this part here, Maybe instead of having three dimensions, I only have two. It's very natural because nothing has changed in my abstraction space. Okay, but but you, you, you know what this means? It means that 
you can't really change your abstraction space here. Like you have hemisphere neglect, you cannot suddenly just like picture everything as both hemispheres. You will you will lose certain part of your vision, but at the same time, um, you will be still able to use the same abstraction space to do the mapping. Yeah, what you cannot do is you cannot take previous memories that you have stored and map them to something different. It's very very difficult. Like you take a previous life experience you have, and you try to reimagine it like mapping to something else. I think I think that's almost impossible. Yeah. So. Okay, anyway, this one is just my hypothesis. There's no uh, real scientific proof for this. But what uh, I want to show is that I think the memory abstraction is a very important process because by using the memory abstraction, we are able to use it to generalize. By mapping to a lower dimensional space, you are able to use these memories and process it in the same way as you would for another situation. And then if you apply uh, whatever I talked about earlier, which is this reference and motion, you can apply it to even more situations because you can just take your abstracted memory over here. This abstraction space will be like your initial reference point plus your motion. All right. You can then apply this kind of memory to another memory and another memory and so on. Yeah. So this, um, sorry, to another situation. So I think this two works hand in hand. Like how this works in an overall architecture, I still have to think about it, but these are just some thoughts that I have. Yeah, maybe I'll just pause here for a while. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, let's move on to the various types of memory. So these are the various types of memory that I feel um, exist. All right, <laughs> of course, the first one is biological, which is neuron, neuron based. The second is non biological, which is more like those kind of read write, hard drive, you know, computer storage kind of memory. So over here, what you can see is that on the left, we have the like kind of biological kind of memory based on neural networks. Okay, of course, this is only feed forward. Okay, in the actual brain, you know, you can have feedback connections as well. So um, this is fast to execute because you only need to like, you take the, the query here. Let's say this is your query or rather this is your key. Oh uh, yeah, this is your query. And then you can map like the key and value is inside this network. And then through going through the network, you get your value out here. So it's just a one pass, you get your value straight away. It, but the bad thing about this kind of network is it's slow to learn. As any of y'all have done deep learning before, you would know that you would take many epochs or many iterations in order to train the network such that the weights converge to what you want. Okay, then over here on the right, we have a different kind of memory. One I like to call like hash tables. So the hash table kind of memory is like this. Okay, you have a query, or rather you have key and a value. So like your key and value can be like, if you have a memory about like, let, 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 let's talk about memory that is uh, that, uh, a nice food to eat. So like, let's say you want to say food I like. So that, that's, that's the key. And then maybe the value can be like apples. So it's like an instant kind of retrieval. Okay. But the problem with that is in order to get this memory, you need to have this lookup table and this lookup table can be huge. Okay, so there's, there's a need to sort of select the right entry from the lookup table, lookup table, which is slow in general if you have a lot of entries, but you can do like approximate nearest neighbors and so on. You can you can make it faster, you can do hashing. Yeah, so, so there, there's some ways to bypass this problem. Uh, but one main thing about this kind of memory, like in this kind of, uh, non-biological memory using hash tables, the main advantage is that you are able to learn quickly. You are able to learn like just from one single experience, like what I talked about earlier, you see a snake. Okay, then you don't want to go that path anymore because you see that snake on that path, you don't want to, to get attacked. So if you were to use this memory to learn about the snakes, this memory here, okay, you will take forever to learn it. <laughs> It'll take forever. So, so you must be wondering, like, our brains don't really use this key value memory. Why do we learn so fast? Okay, I mean, it turns out that once you have a memory about fear, you have you go through the amygdala. Amygdala. Okay, I hope I spell it correctly. But after you go through this, actually, it gives you neurotransmitters who remember stuff very clearly. Yeah, so whatever you remember in fear kind of 
is remembered through your whole life. Like, it's very hard to forget. So somewhat like we have these emotions to regulate important memories. And these memories will be triggered the first few memories that you remember when you see a new situation. So um, our, our brain actually um, does like, like memory importance weighting through emotions quite, uh, quite readily. Like fear emotions will cause your memory to be remembered for life, like almost for life. And I guess um, there's some form of like, I, I believe there's some form of association with like your stimuli and then you will have this memory association somewhat like this. Okay, somewhat like this. Um, that, that there's some, uh, this this is something like uh, I think there's Hopfield networks for the. It, it's quite auto associative memory. So they are not exactly a key value function, but it's, it performs a similar role. So you are able to retrieve memories that are more important to you just by like the way they are stored. So. Although I would say this is a non-biological way of doing it, but auto-associative memories might approximate something like this. So, I mean, it can be still valid for, for I mean, if we're talking about memories in biological organisms, so this hash table might still be valid, although it's of a different kind of form. All right. So, uh, this is something that is interesting because I believe you need both kinds of memories to learn. You need this slow one-pass neural network and you need this fast retrieval of like, or rather fast learning of, of new stimuli using some form of hash table. So this is what I did in my, um, in my paper, learning fast and slow. So I actually did a reinforcement learning kind of problem where you are supposed to navigate the maze. You have a start state and you have a goal state. Okay, and I showed that this method actually wins like all the state of the art um, reinforcement learning methods. Okay, like PPO, uh, proximal policy optimization. It wins this, uh, on a on, on a maze environment that involves a start state and a goal state and like random obstacles inside the maze. Okay, and it's, it's learning using two mechanisms. Uh, one mechanism is using fast, uh, uh, sorry, this neural network, which is like given the goal state and given the start state, what is my next action? So it learns this using self-supervised learning. Okay, I'm not going to go in detail because this is not the focus for today. The focus for today is this memory. So this memory part stores transitions of what has happened earlier. So you can use this trend, you can use this uh, what has happened earlier to do some form of planning. Like for example, if I'm I'm at this uh, if I'm starting from this state. Okay, I use a different color. If I'm starting from this state over here, okay, I can then I retrieve from my memory. Oh, have I been to this state before? Yes, then I go. Okay, and, and take like an action that I've taken from this memory and so on. And you can find like a series of actions such that you can hopefully reach the goal. So there's some form of look ahead planning here. And if you can reach the goal, okay, you can then use this action to override your like fast neural network action. So this is like a look ahead. You And we use memory as a way to do look ahead. And this is uh, something that I think is quite... Uh, it's quite in line with what I was sharing earlier, like memory has a starting position plus a mo motion, right? So this is the reference point and the direction that you move is your movement. So reference and movement. So you store things in reference plus movement, reference plus movement. Yeah, so um, this is something that uh, is utilized here as well. And one good thing about this system is that you just need to learn one half from the start to the full state Okay, you can then like sort of retrieve that path to reach the goal state. So at, at the first instance, your slow network is very important because your slow network is the one that like memorizes the answer. But over time, okay, as you learn more and more things, maybe your memory might fade over time. Yeah, I, I didn't program it in, in this paper, but your memory would fade over time after a while. And after your memory fades, the only thing that is remembering like from the start to the goal state is this fast neural network. Okay, so memory plays a huge role in our learning, especially at the beginning. Okay, so uh, that's more or less the part that I have to talk about, like my own thoughts. Now the next part would mainly focus on what other people have done so far using memory in the transformer architectures. 
Okay, and then we will see like how people have tried to use memory to augment the like internal representation of the transformer and try to get better performance. Right. So anytime if you all want to talk more about the particular system, feel free to just um, just let me know. Okay, by just talking or uh, asking a question on the chat. Right. But if not, I will be going through this uh, one by one and just highlighting like what the potential benefits and what the potential drawbacks of such memory systems. Okay, also bear in mind what I covered earlier about the reference point plus the movement. Let's take a look and see whether all these memory systems, do they do something similar? Okay, so first uh, is this thing called memformer. I, I quite like this. Sorry, Grace asks, is the concept of hot field networks associative memory linked to Pavel Pavlovian conditioning in psychology? Okay, so the way that the memory works, all right, is just a way to like, given a particular stimuli, you try to generate the, the outcome in a sort of auto-associative way. So um, it's just a method of memory retrieval. So Pavlovian conditioning is more like the behavioral conditioning process where like given like a bell ringing, you know, the dog will salivate the while because you present food. So the dog associates the bell with the food. Yeah, so I guess you could think of it as, uh, I mean, it's related because I mean, the dog needs to learn the associations in their memory first before they can survive it. So um, of course, memory will be linked to classical conditioning. Yeah, but in the case for today, I think you can just treat it as separate because we are just talking about how we recall stuff in our memory here. Uh, we don't have to bring in Pavlovian conditioning. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about um, the MAM former. So the MAM former is a, actually it's not very old, it's quite recent. It's just one year ago, right? 2022, right? So this memory architecture is using the transformer. Okay, this is the encoder side on the left. So if you all remember the original transformer, the encoder was meant for like, the original text, like Jazz Swiss student or something like that. Yeah, so it's some French text and then, over here will be I am a student. Yeah. So you are like doing a translation pass. And then this part on the left, the encoder, is like another language. And the decoder here tries to decode it into English. So one way of viewing the encoder is that you are storing the key value pairs for the foreign language. So whenever you are trying to like try to translate, like maybe you start with like I. Okay, and then you want to find out what next word I want to do. So over here, the key and values come from the encoder and the query comes from the decoder. So maybe the decoder is asking, all right, I need to decode. I, I, I need to come up with a word, all right? Um, based on what I have over here, you know, what's your best bet? Okay, maybe you do switch, it's is, you know? So maybe the encoder side will give back, like, just do a word with the meaning is yeah so like after you do the encoder side so you query the encoder and then the encoder will tell you okay i need something that has the meaning is because my original sentence consists of just swiss something i i'm not familiar with french but like i am a student in french must be some I, I think it looks like this yeah so after you query the encoder the encoder will give you like okay this is the value that it gives you back so after you process some more you realize that maybe i will get you the word M because it's the most similar to whatever is, is on the original side of the encoder side of the transformer. So uh, what this system does is that using the original encoder decoder transformer architecture, right, they augment memory all right, at the encoder side. And this memory is of a fixed length. It has a certain number of uh, memory tokens at the beginning. And these memory tokens will then be used okay, to give additional context to whatever like segment over here. And um, you can actually do this such that, you know, you your first memory of the first segment, because you can split your, because encoder, sometimes you have a very long text. Okay, you may not be able to like store everything fully. What you can do is you can then split this into various segments. Okay, go through the encoder uh, model, write it to some memory, and then this memory will then be used in a recurrent manner to go back to the next part of the segment, like segment two, all right? 
where you can store the next part of the sentence. Okay, and this memory T plus one here would be the compressed representation of earlier segments. So it's, it's a bit like a recurrent neural network because like you have your recurrent neural network looks like this. You have your initial input X1. Okay, and then you have the hidden representation H1 here, right? And the initial uh, input representation will go to the output after softmax. Okay, so your next input here would be X2. And X2 is not just X2. X2 also takes into account this hidden representation that comes from the earlier side of the uh, architecture. And then using this hidden representation plus X2, you get Y2. So, I mean, if you were to think, think of it in an equation format, this will be like Y2 equals to G or F X2 H1. Yeah. So, like, you, you can use the same thing, like Y1 equals to F X1. Okay, actually, X1 H0. That's a H0, hidden state zero. If you are familiar with recurrent neural networks, the starting uh, H is H0, which usually is learned by backpropagation, or it can be a, a zero vector. So, this is actually very similar to this. They just basically map the RNN architecture into the transformer architecture. And the benefit of doing so is that you, you see X1 and X2 here. You can split your very, very long passage into different chunks, different segments, and then you can keep doing it recurrently. Okay, so that you can then, like for the starting segment, okay, so you, you also decode segment by segment. Yeah, so the, the idea is that with this memory, you can actually encode in like, longer segments okay but again um, this actually has some problems the problem is that the memory is of fixed length okay and if you have a memory of fixed length here your compression will have a problem here because you're compressing everything in this hidden representation with fixed length as your input sequence gets longer like for example x3 x4 your hidden representation will have the burden of storing all the earlier sequences so let me highlight what this means. If, like for example, this X3 over here, the X3 hidden state will be in charge of storing everything over here. So this is not exactly a good thing to do. And uh, that's why RNNs didn't do too well. All right, so try and combine a bit of RNN into this, uh, in, into this transform architecture. And I, I would say that the idea is interesting, but maybe this is not exactly the right approach to do this, okay, because, uh, you know, when you do this kind of recurrent stuff, you tend to have lossy compression, which is not exactly that great. Okay, so a, a very, very similar idea. I'm not sure whether this is the same people. Oh, sorry, yeah. This is U, okay, this is Bulatov at L. Yeah, so this um, is called a recurrent memory transformer. So recently there's been some hype about this paper. They say a transformer that scales up to 1 million tokens or more. Yeah, so this idea is actually very similar. Right, the similar to the, the other one that you saw just now, the mem format. You have a memory, okay, and then you have a segment. And then what happens? You go through the transformer layer, and then you output a memory. Uh, like basically, other than the output, okay, you also output the memory for the next time step. And this memory will then be transferred over to the next segment. Okay, and then you can then process in the same transformer layer again. So all this memory can be back propagated because like the way of generating this memory came from the earlier time step. So you can actually back propagate your gradients all the way back. So it's a back propagatable memory. And um, the memory helps to like tie the information of the earlier segments in the next few sections of the transformer. So as you go through the this is this direction is like as segment length increases. You, you do more recurrent operations of the same transformer architecture. So um, this helps to, definitely helps to increase the context length because okay, if you all are not familiar with transformers, um, the pitfalls of transformers is that when you want to do your attention mechanism, you kind of need to do this equation. So you need to do this query key transpose, okay? divided by some normalizing factor, which is normally the dimension length of the, of the transformer vector. Okay, then you do the softmax of this. 
and then you times the value. So um, this operation is uh, actually O n squared. Yeah, I mean, there have been some architectures like flash attention that try to reduce the complexity, but it's still in general quadratic. So if you were to have a, a token length of this n is the token length. So if you have a token length, like an uh, increasing token length, like maybe 1 million tokens, you can imagine that this O1 million square is something that is probably not computable by today's uh, GPU hardware. Okay, But if you were to split your initial memory into different segments, and then you have this memory okay, to kind of type over the information from the earlier parts, maybe you, know, you could you, you, you could actually like increase the amount they attend to because okay, let me just give you an example. If let's say I have 100 tokens, okay, O n squared will be 10,000, right? But if let's say I split up into 10 tokens, 10 tokens, 10 squared is 100. Then basically I just do this 10 times. So this one will be equals to 1,000 tokens. Okay, can you see that? So the runtime complexity is, is like uh, an order of magnitude lower as compared to if I were to use all 100 tokens at the same time. If I were to just use 10 tokens, I just have like all 100 runtime, and then I do this 10 times, it, it can be similar to all 1,000 runtime. So that, there's a bit of a, there's a big decrease in complexity here because the we kind of split our original input into smaller chunks for processing. Okay, but what's the problem of this? Okay, what's the problem? The problem is that like the memformer architecture, it has some compression loss. Okay, because you need to have this memory kind of retain the information of all the available, all, all the previous segments, right? So you have some compression loss here, okay, which is why transformers were invented in the first place because we want to prevent this loss, all right? And it's also can be slow in processing because in order for this part to be processed, you kind of need this part to be processed, the earlier part to be processed. So you, you need to do sequentially, which can take a while especially if you have a lot of sequences. Yeah, but in general, if you look at the paper here, you can look at this uh, scaling transformer to 1 million tokens and beyond with RMT. Um, this paper shows that the transformer itself uh, didn't lose too much of its memory by doing this recurrent manner. So maybe this could be helpful if you want to scale your like prompt a bit longer, yeah, but you incur a bit more runtime. Okay, so actually you see this first tool over here, it's not exactly the memory I was talking about, right? This, this is basically how to increase like context length, right? By using recurrence, okay? But it's not exactly like the reference point plus movement. Okay, I'm just showing here because these are like what um, the common uh, literature is talking about memory right now. This memory is really just to type over whatever came from earlier, right? This thing here is similar, okay? But this doesn't use recurrence. This thing here, if you want to do the context length increase, what they do is in the layer before the softmax layer, we have this k nearest neighbor attention plus like the whatever attention that we have earlier on. So there's a gaping thing. And then what you do is with a certain proportion, you use this uh, k and n embeddings and the other proportion, I think the proportion g, Proportion G, you use the KNN attention, attention and the proportion one minus G, where basically G is a number between zero and one. Yeah, so you weigh the amount of embeddings uh, you use from your previous key value pairs and your next, next part of the architecture. So this is uh, interesting because all these things that you are looking for, all this key value pairs here is actually stored from the earlier layers. So if you know how the attention mechanism works, the way attention is done is that you only attend to tokens from the past. Okay, so like for example, here I only attend to here, uh, one token before. This layer here can actually attend to all the tokens from the past. So this is actually doing a uh, sort of attention to Imagine all these key value pairs are tokens of the past or so. Like you attend to like earlier tokens of the past. So it is okay to do something like that because when you do a new embedding here, all you need to do is to attend to everything in the past. Like over here, you can attend to everything in the past here. 
But instead of doing it in all in the same layer here, where you need to do like n squared, you use a uh, approximate k nearest neighbors to retrieve only the relevant uh, key value pairs. Okay, and then you do some form of attention based on whatever you seen earlier. This is like earlier tokens. And then you have your current token embeddings. So I, I quite like this approach because you know it's trying to artificially inflate the amount of things you attend to. Okay, just by using this k nearest neighbor lookup. So in, instead of putting, I mean, ideally, if we have enough compute, we would want to put all these earlier tokens here. We want to put all these earlier tokens here and do them all in the same attention layer as your current tokens. And I mean, that's the ideal. But if you have a, a runtime constraint, you cannot hit the O n squared uh, time complexity of attention. You can then use this k, k, k nearest neighbor attention, which is very fast. I think it's like n log n, it's a sub project. You can use this k nearest neighbor's attention to perform your attention of the earlier tokens and your current tokens in, in a much faster way. And actually this paper showed that, you know, they can do math papers of a thousand pages or so on. And they can still like, for example, if you want to reference like maybe the Fibonacci theorem, it's able to go back 20 pages and take the reference of the Fibonacci theorem and use it to solve the question. So this is quite cool. I think this is actually more promising than, um, than what you've seen here, like this recurrent memory transformer and this memformer. It is more promising because there's no loss of memory due to compression. You don't have to compress a fixed length memory segment okay, that stores all the previous segments. You don't have to do this. What you do instead is you then reference all these things here from your nearest neighbor lookup which are like based on vector similarity and you can then use it to sort of constrain your output. I like this quite a lot. Actually, there's quite a lot of resemblance with this method and the earlier, uh, earlier stuff I was talking about memory. The main thing that you can see over here is that when we do this K nearest neighbors lookup, you are actually referencing memories that are most similar to your current memory, to your current state. Okay, and then you use this to do your like sort of decision making. So in some sense, this referencing of memories, you can treat it as like you are referencing the, the reference point plus movement. So because uh, you know when you do transformers, you don't really split the reference point plus the movement. Okay, I mean if you think of it, reference point plus movement, it is key and anyone want to tell me what the what the movement is pet uh if you look at the uh, transform architecture what is movement pet to okay you are a bit quiet today it's value right because you reference based on the key and then your value could be like how you move so in some sense the initial point plus movement might be sort of reference inside a transformer architecture Okay, we just need to group the key as the reference point and the value as the movement. So maybe this does something like the reference point plus movement that I was talking about earlier. Okay, and then you can then map this back here in order to do the processing. So I quite like this architecture. I think there's a lot of promise for this. And you know, if you do this, if OpenAI does this, we can probably have like 1 million tokens or so. Yeah, and this would be much more lossless and much faster than the one that you saw earlier using the memformer or the recurrent memory transformers. Yeah. Uh, any questions so far for all this? Okay, I hope you all understand because like I think all these things here are a bit advanced. Yeah, and I didn't really go through the background of the transformer. So I hope you are okay. All right. If anything, just let me know, all right? So this is the idea that, uh, let's see, I might, okay, yeah, John, no worries, Grace, I'll send you the reference later. Uh, yeah, so for this, this is something new, all right, this is something that I've been thinking about. So, okay, so for, forget about this architecture for a while, just think about how you retrieve memory. So how we retrieve memory is like this, like, for example, you're doing a certain action, like, for example, tying a shoe, all right, you just look at tying a shoe. If I ask you, 
how do you tie your shoe? Then you will think about like all the steps that you take to tie the shoe. I need to tie a knot crisscross, butterfly knot crisscross, something like that. Yeah, so this is like how is one level lower of retrieving the memory. I can also ask you, why do you tie a shoe? Then you will think about, oh, I tie a shoe because I need to get out of my house. I need to wear my shoes. So you're thinking about one level higher. And actually, the way we do like decision making has a lot of different levels also. Like you need to think about what you want to do right now. Like right now, you are like probably trying to, to learn something from me, I guess. And then like, how do you want to do it? Oh, maybe through this uh, Zoom session. Like how do you learn in the Zoom session? Oh, maybe understand the slide. So you can actually think about things in different levels of hierarchy. And the way we reference things for different contexts is also quite hierarchical. And um, the benefit of doing this hierarchical memory retrieval is that you can reuse different components up and down the hierarchy. Like, for example, if this hierarchy is about school, I mean, this, this section is about school, and this section is about home, all right? In school and in home, you can still do the same things, right? You can still, like at the bottom here, I mean, what, what are the things you do at school and you do at home? Eat is one of them. Yeah, you can you can you can actually do like the same stuff here. You can also like maybe drink or maybe walk. Yeah, you can do all these kind of actions at different uh like I call them reference planes. Okay. So the same memory, all right, you can do like the sub skill and the big skill in like there's a lot of like compartmentalization. Like you can use reuse the same actions at different kind of contexts. And you know you can reuse all these things here to different contexts. And then once you add in this like eat, you go up one level of abstraction, you go school. So this, this memory here might be eating at school. And then this memory here, if you do it, it'll be walking at home. If you if you do, do up the hierarchy like that. And you know, for all these kinds of things that you do. Like you can also like reference past memory at every level. Like for example, if I'm eating, I can reference memories of myself eating based on my past memories and I can get, do a better performance of my action eat. All right, same thing. Once I go up the hierarchy, I go to school. Okay, if let's say this is home, all right, this is home. If let's say this is about home, all right. I can then reference everything that I do at home. And then I get a better context and better grounding of like, okay, so over here, this is a, okay, let, let's call this walk, okay, because home is walk. So if I were to get a better memory of like what walking is based on my past memory, and then once I go up one level of hierarchy, so this is like going up one level of hierarchy to one layer of transformer, I can then like reference like the past memories of what I did for home. All right, and then this would give me a better representation of what walking at home is. You can also use like whatever you've done in the past of walking at home, and then you can use it to like do the action for walking. So um, this hierarchical memory retrieval is, I think, very powerful. I haven't really seen it done anywhere yet. I think this should be the next steps because if we can compartmentalize our memory into like different levels, you can reuse a lot of whatever you learn in different situations and apply them to new situations. And this is actually quite powerful. So um, just uh, think about this, sorry, right? think about this. I haven't come out with architecture for this yet, but I mean, if I were to come out, it will look like what I show you here. Yeah, you just have more K neighbor nearest, K neighbors, K nearest neighbor lookups. Then you can do something like this in a hierarchy. Okay, so next, I have something interesting to let everyone see, all right? So this is uh, something that has excited me over the last month because all along I thought memories must be in some vector form, some vector embedding form. But recent papers have shown me that you can also do memory in text form. Okay, so I think a lot of you all here will be excited to know that AI systems might be able to store memory as text. And then when you look at their memory, you can look at text and then you can immediately understand what they have been through. So first, okay, maybe just a show of hands here. Who here has heard of this paper, the generative agents paper, where you have like 25 different agents and then 
they let each of them interact with each other and see what's the outcome. Any of you here have heard of it? Yeah, Yong San heard of it. I think Zeri was here also the last time I was talking about this. So this paper is quite interesting because it shows like how agents when imbued with different memories can actually perform different actions. And this is like in a group setting. Here, I'm not going to focus too much on the multi-agent aspect. I'm going to talk about how they store the memory. They store the memory as hex. <laughs> this is quite cool. You look at this. In the memory stream, they store like that's is idle, bait is idle. You can see like stuff like that. Based on this text alone, you can then like retrieve the relevant things. So like for example, uh, you are planning a Valentine's Day party right now. So like you can then like maybe retrieve from your memory like, oh, um, the party is at what time? Yeah, so you can retrieve like, okay, over here they didn't really show it, but you can retrieve details about the party, okay? Just by using like some prompt here. And you can then retrieve text as your the way to condition your memory. So we call this retrieval augmented generation. So the, the way this works is like you have memory one, memory two, like you, re you retrieve certain memories, like maybe in this case, we retrieve three memories and then you do a prompt. So the memory at whatever you retrieve will help to ground your, your generation of, of your outcome. So like over here, this is the generation. I'm looking forward to this party, yeah, something like that. So this is the, like, this is the question here. What are you looking forward to most right now? Then you retrieve the memory based on relevance to like, what are you looking forward? So this text-based memory thing is, you're able to do stuff like retrieval augmented generation, and you can then retrieve semantically similar memories. Of course, like, if you're interested on how they did it, they actually did some form of a sentence embeddings, which is like, you can look at the open AI vector embeddings. Yeah, so you are able to represent every sentence as an embedding, and then you use cosine similarity to, to, to find the closest match. Okay, so this is actually only one criteria of their paper. It's called relevance. Okay, there's also stuff like importance, Importance the agent will rate it themselves. Recency is like when was the memory last put in. So the more recent, the higher the score. So I mean I won't go too much into this. I have a video on this, so you can take a look at this if you are interested. Uh, what I want to highlight over here is that this uses text to ground actions, and this is actually quite powerful because if we can interpret what the text is just by storing them as memory, like storing the text as memory, um, you can actually use this to like do arbitrary things. A lot of things can be stored as text and you may not even need to learn the abstraction that is needed like in the, in the uh, embeddings case. Like, you know, if, if you look at the earlier slide, I was saying that memory, you need to have this abstraction space, right? Like, so that you can reuse the same memories with the same context. If you were to store memory as text, your abstraction space is just the token embeddings, which usually don't change the token embeddings of your transformer. So by storing the memory as text, your abstraction space is fixed already. And then you can use this text to do the downstream task of interpretation, which is really cool because like this kind of shows and also kind of justifies the hypothesis, hypothesis I have that you need to have this abstraction. So if you don't use text, like we use this kind of uh, um, tokens here, then you need to fix your embedding layer here. You need to fix this embedding layer, which is typically what is done in transformers anyway. So transformers already do this abstraction space fixing by fixing the initial embedding layer. You, you don't train it anymore. Okay, because you know, if you think about this, if you were to change this embedding layer, all of your previous embeddings here might be changed <laughs> because your key value pairs like build up from the initial embeddings. So you need to fix this. You need to freeze this initial embeddings. Then you can have this kind of memory. All right, then this memory would then be useful. So this is something that is quite important to, to understand. All right, and by storing it as text, okay, as, as long as the way you do your text embeddings don't change, like you use the same like OpenAI vector embeddings, okay, you can then 
use text as a very reliable way to store memory. And one good thing about text, okay, I'm going to highlight this. One good thing about text is that it is low dimensional. So I don't know if you all heard of Yen Le Kun. Okay, Yen Le Kun once mentioned that the image domain is very high dimensional because like imagine every single pixel, like you have RGB plus maybe transparency. Okay, each of them have 255 values. So it's like 255 to about four. All right, so it's just that many pixels. Uh, one single pixel has 255 to about four possibilities. And then you still need to multiply by the number of pixels that you have like M times M maybe, yeah. So it is huge, but you can compress this whole picture into like dot catching a frisbee. Okay, can you see that if you compress your image into like a, a text, like dot catching a frisbee, you can actually compress a lot of pictures. Like for example, this is a dot, right? Okay, my dot sucks, okay? I'm, I'm not a, <laughs> okay, but, but yeah, it, a dot catching a frisbee like that. Another picture of a dog catching a frisbee could be like that. And the frisbee is here. See, different streams of input, but gives you the same text representation. So in some sense, we are doing our abstraction using text. Okay, so um, this first part of mapping of the abstraction into like a common denominator here. Like this is typically done using stuff like digital question answer. And all these things, if you store them as text, you will be able to do this abstraction for multiple various frames of inputs of different kinds of um, modalities and also different kinds of like, like here the dog is on the left, moving to the left, here dog moving to the right. All this can be mapped to the same uh, abstraction space. And then you can then process using um, this, this input to like do some decision making. So if you are able to find a good way to map things into a very low dimensional space, like text, this text can be an abstraction space. And this abstraction space can be very, very useful for decision making. So I, I really like the idea of using text as memory. Okay. So this paper did this. Uh, they didn't exactly do from image to text, but I think image to text using visual QA will be one of the key breakthroughs for stuff like reinforcement learning. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to bet on that. Yeah, this, this will be one of the key ways of improving reinforcement learning systems, right? I'm also trying to do something similar for the ARC challenge. Later, you, later I'll share with you. Okay, so uh, what this paper does is that they do hierarchical prompting from the most broad actions to the most specific actions. So actually this paper hit a lot of the points that I was talking about earlier. Like, I think maybe I was influenced by this paper also, but this idea of hierarchy is there. Like you ask the agent, like maybe what are you look most looking forward to most right now? You can say at Hop's Cafe like that. You can then follow up the question like, what are you going to do at the Valentine's Day party? So, so you can you can like ask more narrow specific questions. Um, the way they did hierarchical prompting is like um, name like maybe seven broad sections of your day. So maybe they can say like uh, breakfast, XXXX, sleep. So then like, and it's like, you can then ground like, what are you going to do to prepare breakfast? And you can like, step one, step two, step three. So, so it, it's quite cool because you can use this memory, you extract the relevant memories. Yeah, I don't know whether they did this for, for their use case, but you can imagine that if let's say you want to plan your day, you can extract out relevant memories from the broad sections of your day. like of your previous day, maybe like what you did. And then once you want to do like the breakfast part, you can then extract out the memories that are only related to breakfast. So you are actually doing some form of top level planning, the broad level planning, more specific level planning. And all this can just be done using semantic similarity of text-based memory. So you can do whatever I was talking about, like in this previous slide here, you can do whatever I was talking about just by doing memory retrieval of your like maybe your memory stream, you can, can condition on the general stuff and the detailed stuff already. It is very powerful. This is very, 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 very powerful. Yeah, I don't know how to emphasize this, but I've been uh, shown all this text-based memory recently, and I think that the world is about to change because all these systems will be very powerful.
Okay, this is another example. This is, I'm not too sure if you have heard of it. Thumbs up if you have seen it before. This is called external task-based memory, task-driven autonomous agent Langchain. So using GPT-4, Pinecone, and Langchain for diverse applications. Anyone has heard of it? Okay, if you haven't, the idea is very simple. Instead of just having one GPT agent, you have different GPT agents. One agent will be to create your tasks. Okay, like for example, to create a website. Then this task creation agent can then like add new tasks to the task queue, like saying, oh, in order to create a website, you need to first do a CSS file, HTML file, and so on. Then what will happen is that you have an agent to prioritize the task. Okay, one agent will then say, okay, first I need to create the HTML file. Okay, then it goes to the execution agent. The execution agent will then say, like, oh, okay, um, I need to create the HTML file. Let me take a look at relevant past examples of what I've done. So there's memory retrieval. And then after that, you do the you do the task. So the memory here can store successful task input output. Okay. And you can also use the previous successful task input output to then condition your execution agent so that it generates something very, very similar to what you want. So in some sense, memory helps to condition the generation in a manner that is consistent to your overall goals and objectives. So this goal-directed learning can simply be done by conditioning on the right memory. That's something that's very powerful. And it is something different from my fast and slow architecture because over here, the fast and slow architecture did not retrieve the memory and then condition the action on it. Okay, but with GPT-4, you can do something like this. You can retrieve memory as text and you can condition on this. Very powerful, okay? And um, okay, you may not have heard of this diagram here, but I'm sure you have heard of baby AGI, right? Who here has heard of baby, baby AGI? Anyone? Okay, so this was one of the big hoo-hahs in, um, in, in the field of AI recently. And I would like to just say that baby AGI is the same as as this guy. Okay, this external task-based memory thing that I was talking about. This is the more complicated version of baby AGI. This is the more toned down version. Okay, it's by the same guy, Yohei Nakajima. All right. And uh, this is like very similar to auto GPT, but I, I quite like this code base better than auto GPT. It's clearer and easier to read. Everything is in one Python file. So baby AGI, um, I just want to highlight baby AGI because okay, they did one thing that is different from the earlier slide. Okay, they did this thing here, enrich results. Okay, so enrich context in vector database. So I was thinking about it, like what's the use of it? Why do we need to enrich the context? So um, after thinking about it a while, I realized that, okay, maybe this is actually used to shape the memory to be more relevant for future retrieval. Because if we were to store the memory as is, okay, maybe it is not like, General, uh, general enough, or maybe it is not specific enough. So depending on your use case, you might enrich it differently. So enriching can be some form of, I'm just going to write here. It's like abstraction. So you're trying to abstract the memory in the right way. So the other word that is probably used is called enrich. Okay, I unfortunately am not able to see what they mean by enrich because when I look at the code for baby AGI from this website here, um, they say that the enriching part has been removed. <laughs> they say that yeah, by default, it doesn't use the enrich. Okay, but I'm curious what they meant by this enrich context. So if any of you here knows about this, feel free to let me know. Um, but what I would like to say is that this enriching step could be something very similar to the abstraction step I was talking about earlier. We try to abstract the memory to the relevant form such that you can then use this to do future planning more easily. So of course, this will be all grounded on the context. So like the high level task will ground like how you represent your memory. Like if for example, if you are walking on a field, okay, the high level task is like you are playing soccer. The way you walk might be different from like if you are walking on the field going home because there's no like urgency. There's no need to like look out for other players to pass you the ball, uh, that kind of stuff. So like the abstraction space might be a way to like ground from the context above from the high level um, activity you are doing to make the memory like more relevant for future such activities, future similar activities. So ah, who knows? I mean, this is something that is a, an interesting thing that I, I just recently read. Ah, all right. So this is the final thing that I'm going to, okay, second last thing I'm going to cover. 
This is a retrieval augmented generation, which is what I talked about earlier. You take in past memories, like for example, you extract out from like external memory. Okay, what is school of for good and evil? Is a fairy tale? Is a book? Is a blah blah blah? So after that, you can then condition the output, and you get soman chinani, chinani, right? So I mean, compared to like direct questioning like that, um, the advantage is that it can give you more consistent generation of the output, and also it's make it is able to get the answer better because sometimes if you ask it directly you may not get the answer because you don't really have this background to con uh, condition the output and and the large language model may not get the answer directly easily sometimes okay so this is retrieval augmented generation very powerful and can be used easily with text-based memories okay because you can then use the text past memories to ground your query your query is like the question okay and this is very powerful. I think this tool will be used in future AGI systems. If there's any AGI systems, it will use something like retrieval augmented generation. The thing that I want to show you here is actually not retrieval augmented generation. Is this new thing called recitation augmented augmented generation? Something that I just uh, read about last week, and this came out in the ICLR two zero two three paper. Uh, what actually they meant by recitation is instead of using an external memory. Okay, there's no external memory, it's just the neural network waits for the transformer. You ask the neural network like, okay, who wrote the song, I hate you, I love you. So then you can ask it to like, you can give it some hints. So maybe the first hint is like hint singer. Yeah, it's a type of singer. Maybe another hint can be like hints uh, love or something like that. Like, so basically based on the different hints you give it, the generation will be conditioned on your hint and it will be different from the exact memory itself. So like, for example, in the retrieval augmented generation, this is an exact match to the to memory. Okay, but once you do recitation augmented generation, this recitation is conditioned on the context. So you give it various contexts and then you get different recitations out. So all these things over here that you see the recitation augmented generation, all this uh, basically are manipulations of your memory to a form that is similar to what you want. So like all these hints should be relevant to your question. And then you like manipulate your memory to fit the context. So this is my view. I think you can use this recitation technique to alter the memories from the external sources. So like, for example, this school of good and evil is a fantasy fairy tale you can do. Like maybe you can ground it on like context singer. All right. All right. Sorry. Who wrote the school? I think this is a singer, right? Who wrote the school for good? I'm not too sure whether this is a song or not. But let's say if you context on the song, then you can like school for good and evil was sung by a famous singer. I, this is a book. So maybe it's maybe this is a writer. <laughs> was written by famous author, Soman Chainani. So like instead of having the original set of words as though how you do in the book itself or in the external source, you can modify these words to fit whatever context you want by just giving a hint over here. And what's the point of that? Okay, the point of that is like a chain of thought. Like you manipulate your thoughts such that you can solve the the given question more easily. So this modification of memory, in my view, okay, might be like modifying the initial reference frame from your memory closer to your current situations, uh, like reference. So like you can use the reference frame of whatever is stored in your memory. You guide it using a hint and you bring that reference frame closer to your particular context right now so that your memory is more relevant for this situation that you're in, which in this case, like, it's true, like you want to know who wrote this book, School for Good and Evil. So you condition or maybe a context of like maybe a writer and so on. So this recitation thing is fairly new. I think it has promise because it's able to make the memory more relevant to what you want to generate. So in some sense, if even the paper, one of the paper authors, uh Ite, Ite is also a Singaporean, yeah. He worked for Google for a while. He, he left recently, but Ite, he mentioned on his Twitter feed that 
this retardation has some similar properties to chain of thought because you, you do a particular hint and then the uh, model generates a certain generation. It's similar to like asking the model, what do you think about this particular piece of memory I, 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 I took for you in this context? So it's like a chain of thought. You are prompting the model to think in that direction. And by doing so, you get more accurate uh, retrievals. So uh, if you look at the paper for this, in general, the recitation augmented generation achieves much better results. Okay, I wouldn't say much better, but better results than retrieval augmented generation. And um, that is without external sources. Okay, so I think if you do it for external sources, you might actually make it even better. So this is uh, my hypothesis. I haven't done any experiments on this, but this is my hypothesis. All right, the last one is uh, something interesting. This is about the up challenge. So I actually uh, wrote an essay for the Lab 42 up <laughs> challenge paper. And what I was thinking is that we can actually use large language models to solve the up challenge. So we can also use hierarchical uh, conditioning or hierarchical memory referencing, and we use text as the memory. So this text could be like, what you do for like, okay, let me just describe what's the up challenge for those who don't know. Up challenge is you have a series of pixels of different colors. Okay, there's 10 different pixel intensities, pixel colors here. And then you have input output pairs. So given input output pairs, you also find the pattern between them. And then you have a test input here. And then what you need to do is to find out what's the test output. So the arc challenge is difficult because you only need to, you can only learn from two or three input output examples and you need to find the general pattern. Computers are not very good at this because computers use the neural networks, which take a lot of examples to learn. Okay. But if you want to solve the arc challenge, you need to generalize. You need to do few short learning very, very quickly. Then LLMs actually do few short learning very well. But the thing is, LLMs are not in the right domain to use for the arc challenge. So what I propose to do is you can actually map all these images into text, okay, using some, okay, I, I didn't write here, but you can use some visual QA to map inputs into text. Yeah, of course, we need to do some fine tuning for this for the app challenge, but suppose you can do this, okay, you can ask the LM to give you the input output relation by asking it to do a hierarchical generation. So instead of doing the detailed st step straight away, you ask it to do broad intent. So the broad intent could be like reduce input grid to smaller size because in this case, there's a squashing happening. And then the beautiful thing is that if you use memory to do like recitation augmented generation or retrieval augmented generation, you can sample similar broad intents you have seen in the past and you try to map it into this image here that whatever fits the input output relation. So after you get the broad intent, you can do the same thing for detailed steps and detailed steps Again, you condition on your broad intent because you already know I want to compress. So what are the detailed steps I can do to do the compression? So maybe like the steps could be like remove every other square from the row and columns. Okay, so we can again do the memory referencing, like retrieval augmented generation or recitation augmented generation. You can condition these detailed steps to make it more and more relevant to the input output pairs. And then in the end, you can then execute and get the answer. So this is the hierarchical memory referencing idea I have applied to text. Okay, and in this case, the text is used to get the right steps for the arc challenge. Okay, I mean, so far I haven't done the memory part, but just this broad intent and detailed steps can solve like two to three problems of the arc challenge already. So it's, uh, it's quite promising. Okay, so now we have like maybe 15 minutes for Q&A or like questions to ponder. So I'll be going through briefly the questions and then uh, each question, maybe I'll pause for a while in case you all want to talk about anything. So yeah, the first question is, should we encode memory as vector embeddings or text? Okay, so this is my view. My view is you need both, okay, because text is useful for high-level domains, high-level abstract domains, like the dog catching the frisbee, okay, while vector embeddings is more for like low-level motion domains, like, like how your hand move. Like it's very hard to say like hand move 90 degrees forward, hand move 45 degrees upwards. Like it's easier to give a vector representation of where your hand is. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on this first question? Okay. If not, we move on to the next one. All right. The next one is like, how can we perform this recitation to alter memories to make it more suitable for the current context? Oh, sorry, this, 
uh, this is recitation for text memories. How do we do recitation for vector embeddings? Okay, actually, in order to answer this question, all right, I can just look at the next question. Okay, because this is actually the uh, question that that I was thinking of. The initial reference plus movement. So we need a way to to um, align the initial reference with the context we are facing now. So, so like you need a way to map the memory's initial reference with the current situation you are facing right now. So this is where the next question comes in. Like maybe we should store the embeddings as two components. Like we need to have an initial reference component and a movement component. And so this initial reference part can be something like the key because you need to like find out what situation is similar to you. And the movement part is the value. But after you find out what's similar to you, you shouldn't just take like the value and add up to your, your key, you know, that kind of thing. You will, you will need to, like right now, transformers don't really do that. They actually do some form of, the value is the embedding space and then you're trying to shift your embeddings closer to your neighbors. It, it's not really doing this initial reference plus movement. Yeah, so um, if you want to do this for transformers, you kind of need to have two different things to encode. You need to have the one embedding for the initial reference and one embedding for the movement. And uh, this should be mapped to the key and value respectively. So right now, when we do self-attention, the query, key, value are the same. Okay, but, but I mean, they are mapped using, are the same starting embedding, mapped differently using MLP. Yeah, maybe I just put. But maybe this architecture needs to change. Maybe we need to have the Q and K. Okay, rather K and V should be separate. Okay, so that we can do the initial reference point plus the movement part. So I haven't thought clearly about how to do this, but this is just, these are some thoughts that I have. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts from anyone? For, for this. Okay, so uh, if not, we move on to the last question. So in general, having more retrieval from memory to ground context helps us with output accuracy. So um, what this means is that um, when you do retrieval augmented generation, you you need to do like prompt, uh, like memory one or retrieval one, retrieval two, retrieval three. Okay, and then you have your prompts. So if you want to do this kind of grounding, you need a very, very, very large context length because like sometimes you have a lot of things you need to retrieve or you have multi-modality, you need to retrieve all the modes, all in text. Okay, so you need some form of increased context length to process all this. So what's the best way to improve the context length in order to do such memory retrieval? Okay, so as what I mentioned earlier on in the earlier slides, I think the most promising approach is this one here, like this kind, because this has no compression loss. Okay, the only loss is like, maybe you need more time to do the key nearest neighbor attention because you need to do some form of like O and log N kind of nearest neighbor retrieval. Yeah, but in, in other words, um, that is the most promising because you can then have infinite contact length earlier on, right? You just need to do K nearest neighbors to the earlier contacts and you can put in prompts of any length you want. So I think that's uh, my favorite way so far. Okay, I've come to the end for today, uh, today's session. Uh, any last questions before I end? Okay, if not, uh, see you all next time. Okay, bye.